morning, everyone. Um, my name's Kevin Ewerks, and I'm the uh, parks one of the park supervisors here with the city of Broomfield. And we're going to be talking about uh, designing a xeriscape yard. And my cohort today is Ashley. Hi, uh, my name is Ashley, and uh, I am a senior technician here at the city and county of Broomfield. I do horticulture work, and Kevin and I will be jumping into the presentation. Yeah, and we're going to apologize in advance. Um, this is new to both of us doing this uh, on a computer screen. Um, I've done this for probably 10 to 12 years. I started this presentation way back when, but I'm used to looking at people and talking to people uh, face to face and, and stuff. So this, uh, I apologize in advance if this comes off, um, not quite as smooth as what I'm used to. But anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, uh, there is a question and answer box that uh, you're more than welcome to uh, type in questions. And um, if we can get to them while we're in the presentation, we will. Otherwise, we'll uh, uh, catch up on those at the end of the presentation. So basically, um, what is their escape? Um, it, it's uh, the Greek word for dry. And this was coined back in 1981 by Denver Water, um, who was looking for a, a term to use um, in looking at trying to get a phrase or a terminology out there to the public to understand how to do landscaping with uh, using as much or as little water as possible. So um, that's where that came from. Um, so anyway, what you're wanting to do is conserve water. Um, you know, most of our water use uh, during the summer months uh, go to outdoor watering, um, anywhere from 30 to 50%, um, pretty high. We'll have a chart later on, a graph later on that uh, breaks it down. But uh, so what we're trying here today is discuss, you know, options and ways to uh, reduce your water use. Um, and then, uh, go from there. Sorry, this is weird. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what we want to do is use water uh, efficient methods to uh, um, provide beautiful landscapes. Uh, we're, we're not asking you to have rock and, and uh, dirt and, and stuff. We want to go ahead and still have luscious and gorgeous landscapes, but there's a, a way to do it to save water. Um, you know, back in the day, we saw when we talked about xeriscape or saving water, it was using rocks in your yard with some yucca plants and stuff like that, uh, that was very unattractive. Uh, but there is a huge selection of trees and plants, uh, both native and, and low water that can be used in the landscape. And uh, we wanna use as many of those as we can with different fragrances, textures, and so forth. So uh, some interesting water water facts. Um, you know, uh, uh, 17 states in Mexico rely on the water that comes from our mountains. So, you know, when we talk about drought uh, conditions, which we are currently in here in Colorado, it's amazing that um, technically we have all the water we would ever need um, right here in the mountains. But uh, due to water laws and and so forth, uh, a lot of that. Uh, a lot of that water goes downstream to provide drinking water and so forth for uh, many other people. Um, one of the other challenges we have here along the Front Range is that 80% uh, of the water is on the western slope. And so uh, getting that across the mountain to our side, where 85% of the population lives, is also a challenge. And uh, so any, anything we can do to reduce water to, to help ourselves out uh, is greatly needed. Um, most of the water right laws date back to the 1850s. Uh, they're on the books. It's uh, been there for a long time. Um, certain people have water rights, um, and that's why, um, you know, when municipalities and so forth say, well, we don't have any more water, well, that water is promised to somebody further downstream, and we're allowed to take what we uh, are allotted and no more than that. So, um, pretty complicated, uh, very legalese uh, type of situation. Um, but uh, uh, that's where this all stems from. <clears throat> um, 
The other issue that we're looking at is our population continues to grow, as you all know, um, any of you that have been here long enough, uh, the past several years, 10 years, um, along the front range and how fast it's growing. And uh, um, we're expected to double by 2050. And, uh, you know, that's, that's quite an increase. If you look uh, at the graph there, or the statement there, it's uh, from 5.6 million in 2017 to 8.7 in 2050. Um, the other issue that we got to be very concerned about is, is we're going to hit a point somewhere and uh, the, the estimates right now are saying uh, somewhere probably by 2050, um, the demands of water will uh, meet or outweigh what our water supply can handle. So, um, you know, that can be kind of scary in a way if, when you get to a point where you know, we're going to have to ration water or whatever. So we're doing whatever we can now to, um, you know, do the best we can to save water and uh, so that we don't have to worry about that down the road. Um, yeah, so one of the, um, William Shakespeare had a, had a saying of uh, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin, that nature brings us all together. And, uh, you know, it kind of is one of those things that, we, that unites us all. So um, values of landscaping, you know, uh, there, there are so many things that are so popular and needed uh, with landscaping. Uh, we wouldn't survive very well without that landscaping, obviously. Um, you know, getting oxygen from the trees and taking in carbon dioxide and um, sequestering our carbon from the air, um, stormwater management. Uh, if we didn't have uh, grass and native plants and trees to soak up water, we would have water um, issues, uh, not holding the soil in place and, and major erosion issues and that type of thing. Um, obviously, as you know, it increases property value, uh, which is good for you when it's time to sell your home. And, uh, um, you know, wildlife habitat, um, place for kids to get out and play and develop uh, uh, their curiosities and that type of thing. <clears throat> So basically today what we're going to talk about is the seven principles of Xeriscape. And we're going to go through all seven of those in a little bit more detail. Um, if you pull up any book or website and you type in Xeriscape, you're probably 99% of the time you're going to find something that says seven principles of Xeriscaping. So that's what we're going to touch base on today and kind of give you some ideas and pointers and things to think about so that if you want to design or redesign your yard, um, you kind of have some uh, things to look at and, and hopefully this will help you guys uh, think think outside the box a little bit from maybe what you're you're used to. So, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and start with uh, planning ahead. Um, kind of talked about that already. So, um, the first thing you really want to do is uh, come up with a plan. What is it you're looking for? Um, you know, how do you want your landscape to look when it's all completed? And so, this is a very important first step. Um, obviously, you can hire somebody to do a landscape design for you, um, or you can do it yourself. Um, what you want to make sure you do is show great detail. Where is everything at? Where is the house? Where is your sidewalks? Where are existing trees and shrubs? Um, where is the sunlight coming from? Uh, what drainage do you have? What's the neighbor's yards? How will they affect what you have? So um, a lot of things to think about. It's not a quick thing. You want to take plenty of time and, and do it right. and. Uh, uh, try to think of everything possible before you move on. Um, anytime you do any digging in your yard, whether you're planting a tree or uh, trenching irrigation lines or any of that type of thing, you always need to call 811. Um, it's a free service. They will come out and mark all utility lines so that you know not to uh, dig with equipment that uh, if you get close to these areas that it's a hand dig only situation and it's required by law. So uh, make sure you do that uh, before you get started doing any uh, major digging and forth work. Um, like I kind of mentioned before, um, look at the sunlight shade. Um, which way does the wind come from? Uh, do you have low spots in your yard that may collect water? Um, do you have major slopes that don't hold water? And uh, where that, uh, you know, it's hard to grow things on a slope because uh, water doesn't stay there. So what can you use those areas for? Um, don't forget your neighbor's yard. You know, how does their big tree, their, uh, affect your shade in your yard and how will that uh, affect where you want to put certain types of plants. 
is this a new area? Is it a brand new home you just purchased and you're looking at ideas to get started? Or is this an area that you want to convert from um, heavy water use type uh, landscaping to something that uses less? Um, what will it be used for? Is it for entertaining? Do you have kids, pets? Um, you know, what, uh, what items uh, are you looking for to use the most? Uh, do you need an area uh, for the dogs to run or do you want a play area, uh, playground little area, stuff like that. Uh, keep those all in mind. Um, the other thing is, is don't forget to understand how big your plants get. When you're planting them, they look pretty barren and you're like, oh, that doesn't look full enough. Well, don't forget that, you know, they're not at their mature size. So you want to plan it in advance and, and look at the tags and find out what the growth habits are of your plants that you want to use. And most important, right place, right, right plant, right place. Um, you can have uh, a plant that is a gorgeous plant, but if it's not in the right sunlight or water zone or whatever, it's not, it's not going to be successful. So one of the things you want to do, um, now this is a, a pictures of uh, one Discombs where the city offices are. Um, the photo on the right is a pretty barren, rough uh, landscape. Uh, in that situation there, they had some temporary offices, mobile offices that they used at one time. And um, once those were, re were removed, that's where we um, added the uh, Broomfield Zurich Garden. And so on the left, um, so planning ahead, <clears throat> excuse me, you want to do uh, you want to do your hardscapes first. You want to get your sidewalks in and um, patios and benches and you know in this case we've got soft trails and boulders and stuff. So you want all those type of things in your landscape first, because um, then you'll work your plantings and your irrigation around those. So from that first picture, here's what our Zero Escape Garden looks now. Uh, it's been around for many years and it's uh, very mature. Um, we've got uh, several different gardens in there, um, which I think we have a slide, yep, coming up. Um, so we have uh, different, 11 different gardens uh, designed with different type of plants for water needs, uh, colors, textures, that type of thing. Um, all of them have uh, cards or um, Printouts of what's in that uh, um, in that uh, garden, and uh, so anyway, that was a collaboration between uh, City and County of Broomfield, Denver Botanical Gardens, and our uh, local CSU Extension office. So planning ahead, um, this is actually uh, my house, or well, not any longer, but it used to be my house. And anyway, my wife and I talked about, we wanted a sidewalk that went from the front door to the street versus uh, people walking up the driveway and so forth. And so uh, funny story, I told my wife that, yeah, I'm gonna rent a sod cutter because that whole front lawn was sod. And uh, I was going to just cut a path from the front door where you see the um, uh, flagstone. And when she got home, she saw the upper left uh, one and wanted to know what the heck did I just do? And I said, well, trust me, it'll, it'll turn out okay. So starting, like I said, doing your hardscapes first, I put in the boulders and the sidewalk, and then the upper left corner you see here, um, I went ahead and planted my plants, put in my irrigation, and then by that fall, um, you can see um, how mature the plants are. Um, uh, Ashley, can you go back one yeah. slide? So if you can look at the tree that's in the in the photo there, the top left when I got started, uh, this was in the springtime, no leaves. It's just starting to bud out. And then obviously in the next slides, we've got summer and fall. So um, so that's a full year's uh, progress right there. So it can turn out to be uh, pretty nice once you put your heart and soul into it. So other things you want to think about um, when you're when you're planning your garden, um, kind of like the lower right, when I mentioned you don't want to fill in the plants too close together because as they mature, then they all blend together. Um, and this could cause some issues with diseases and pests because there's no airflow, um, there's no sunlight to the roots and stuff. Um, you've got issues where um, it's just way overcrowded. Um, think about your maturity of height of plants and stuff in case you've got a window, uh, you don't want it to cover it up. Um, 
you know, in this case, you know, we happen to have a sign in the picture there that um, the dogwood got a little too big and, and blocks it. So think of things like that. Uh, think about what you plan, um, plant along your um, uh, driveway because you got to have to shovel snow as we're going to have to do here in the next couple of days. And you're going to have to shovel that somewhere. So you don't want to uh, damage any plants uh, with any heavy snow and that type of thing. Um, think about uh, what do you want to use your garden for? Do you, you, you want a vegetable garden? You want a flower garden? Um, worry about uh, what certain plants, invite certain pests, uh, you know, make sure that you're aware of those in advance. Is that something you can tolerate? Same with wildlife. The more you plant, you know, you know it creates more homes for um, lots of critters, good and bad. Um, you know, we get the bees and the butterflies and hummingbirds on the good side, but we can get rabbits and voles and and uh, others on the on the bad side. So, you know, plan ahead, think about those as well. Um, you know, there's, you can go out and purchase a color chart if you like to help you uh, um, design a color to what goes well, you know, purples and oranges and purples and yellows are obviously, um, you know, good opposites. And so take advantage of a color wheel if that would help you design your garden. Um, think about how you want it to be. Do you want a formal garden or an informal? Um, Ashley took these photos when she was in France a couple years ago. Um, obviously, um, this is a very formal garden. Um, you know, most people don't go to that extreme, but, um, you know, certain variations of that, of how you want to look very structured, um, you know, very detailed, or do you want something that's a little more informal? Um, which is something like this, where um, you don't have distinct lines, plants blend into others um, and that type of thing. So uh, something to think about uh, how you want to look or you can you know, do one part of the backyard is formal and the other side informal or, or whatever. So um, other things to think about, uh, do you want curvy lines or straight lines? Um, Straight lines become more of a focal point. Um, curvy lines uh, add dimension and give you a little softer touch, a softer feel, um, a little more relaxing versus uh, straight lines, which seems to be more formal, gives you a more formal um, uh, aspect. So hardiness zones, um, that's very important for, uh, for those that uh, are transplants from other parts of the country and come to Colorado to live. Um, not everything that where you lived before may not work here, but if you're in zone five, um, uh, those are the, that's the zone we are in here. And uh, so if you're through that little green belt there, uh, zone five, a lot of the plants that maybe you grew up with will work here as well. Um, if you're in six, seven, obviously um, those won't uh, tolerate our cold winters. So um, when you're out shopping for plants, um, look at the zone descriptions, um, go online. Your catalogs always have a zone description on it as well. So you know that you're getting a plant that will survive in your area. Um, with that being said, so any plant that's in zone like two, three, four, five will work here because it can tolerate colder temperatures. So um, anything above zone five, will work here. Anything south of uh, zone five uh, will struggle. Um, so one of the things that you can do is um, take advantage of the free water that you get that falls off your roof. Um, you know, what comes down your downspouts. Um, you know, you can design your yard to um, flow to where you can take advantage of that water instead of it just um, flowing out to the street or whatever, um, use it to fill in the spots that are, let's say you've got um, more of a Zurich type yard, but you've got a few plants that you're partial to that take a little more water. Um, put those towards the downspout, let that water um, work its way to those plants. Um, you want to start basically at the top of the hill and let it flow down. I believe the next slide will kind of show that, but you want to slow it, spread it, and 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 uh, park it. I don't remember what it said. Slow it, uh, sink it. <laughs> um, so you want to take advantage of of the free water. Um, so the slide shows that you start at the top of the hill, and you can uh, use berms and and stuff to let it meander throughout your landscape, and uh, let it uh, help 
help water the plants that you've got. So take advantage of that. Think about that when you're designing your yard. All right, this is, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Ashley and uh, she'll go from here. Hello, so we're on to the second principle of Xeriscaping and we will talk about improving the soil. Why and how you can do that. So improving the soil, why? Native topsoil is stripped off and sold by the developer builder leaving you with really bad soil. And here in Colorado, we don't have great soil to start with. Uh, most of our soil is generally clay based and that's not great nutrition wise for plants. So how you can improve the soil is taking a soil sample. Oh, hold on, there's an echo and I'm trying to figure out how to turn off my speakers. Okay. Jake, can you Pause. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Back back to the presentation. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Again, like Kevin mentioned earlier, this is our first time doing this over this type of interface. So bear with us. Thanks for your patience. Back to talking about taking a soil sample. So we do have a slide coming up about how you can do that. Um, another way you can do, another way you can improve the soil is by amending the soil. You can till in organic matter and here on the side it's broken down into plant-based compost or animal-based compost. Under the plant-based compost section you can see that it is lower in salt and how you can incorporate it into the top of the soil to be able to help improve the soil. Animal-based compost is higher in salts and nutrient contents and again talking about how best you can incorporate it into the soil to make it better for you and what you need it for. And here, the last point is don't add sand. Um, sand doesn't hold water or nutrients very well. Sand is composed of quartz crystals and these have a relatively low and little ability to hold on to nutrients and water. So that's why we kind of stay away from wanting to add sand into the soil. Of course, there are ways you can add sand if you're utilizing them correctly, but based on what we're talking about, the best way you can do, the best thing you can do for your soil is to amend it, add in that organic matter. So here we talk about soil sampling and what you can do. Um, collect a quart of soil from several parts of your yard, allow it to dry, package it in a gallon freezer size bag, and then you can send it to the lab. You can send it to the Colorado Analytical Lab, which is an independent lab that specializes in organic and organic analysis of water, wastewater, and soil. There are two locations here in Colorado, Commerce City and Lakewood. So Commerce City would be the closest one to Broomfield. Another lab that you can take it to is the Colorado State University Lab, the Soil, Water, and Plant Testing Lab. And then of course from there, you can interpret your results, email the testing facility, bring the results to a local agriculture supplier, or you can visit the local extension office here, which is located inside of the Broomfield Library. And you can also check out online publications through the Colorado State Extension. And based on your results, you can figure out what you can do from there. The next section, the third principle is irrigate efficiently. So Kevin mentioned earlier that you are able to collect rainwater now, which is something that I didn't know that we could do, but it's been since 2016 that it's a legal action that you can do. There is a slide or a couple of slides talking about how you can do that. Here in Colorado, it's dry. We, we are a desert-like climate. Not a lot of plants like to thrive here, but of course, this is why we're talking about this presentation, how you can make your yard look nice without the use of a lot of water. Colorado's annual precipitation is only 15 to 19 inches. That's annual, that's per year, it's not a lot. 
And since 2000, Colorado has experienced the highest average spring and summer temperatures in historical record, meaning that water acquisition will only become harder and harder. Here's uh, this figure that Kevin was talking about earlier, how water is utilized in your home. And one funny story, I was talking to one of my roommates and we come from households where we didn't grow up with dishwashers. And so we always thought dishwashers use a lot of water, but based on this figure here, dishwashers actually only use 1% of your water usage and using the faucet is 8%, which is kind of crazy. And then you're looking at the left side of the pie, outdoor usage of water is 50%. That's half of the water that you're gonna be using in your home. That's a lot. And so here are some ways that you can kind of navigate that and use your water efficiently. So based on that figure, there are different types of irrigation that you can pay attention to based on your needs, drip, netafilm, pop-ups, rotors. And with that, when you're planting, pay attention to how you're planting. Like you wanna zone plant based on water needs. So depending on whether or not certain plants need a little bit more water, some don't, we suggest that you plant based on water needs water deeply and infrequently to develop deep roots and do not water in the heat of the day. Water between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. to help reduce evaporation. As we mentioned earlier, Colorado's dry and the temperature is only increasing as the years come. So if we are watering in the middle of the day, it's not going to do our plants or our yard much justice. And back to the sprinklers, adjust your sprinklers for overspray. Here we have a video clip. Hopefully I can open it up for you guys so you guys can see. And Kevin will maybe describe what this video is suggesting. Let's see here. Oh, it's taking a little bit, it's loading. Slow. It's going slow. So if, if this does pop up, um, it's, it's going to be showing a uh, water running down a gutter. And I took this uh, video when I was out doing a trash run in one of our parks, and it just it just dawned on me that uh, the amount of water that is flowing down into um, the storm sewer was amazing, um, and it was just coming because of somebody was um, overwatering overwatering their yard. Um, the sprinkler heads weren't. Um, positioned very well. So there was a lot of precipitation on their sidewalk and driveway. So obviously that's not going to be very helpful. I mean, that's, and so all that water is water that uh, you paid for. There's a lot of money <laughs> rolling down that gutter um, and then it's not being used properly. Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to get at is to get away from um, irrigating inefficiently. So um, looking at your sprinkler heads and where they're adjusted and and you have to you know you have to check those uh, periodically um, they do go out of adjustment um, over time and it could be within the season or it could be in a couple of years but um, always make sure you're, you're always checking out um, your uh, irrigation to make sure you're very efficient All right. Well, thanks, Kevin, for explaining that. Um, it is a lot of water that is going down the drain. And like you said, that's your money going down the drain. Yes, I should be. And to end this slide, coming back to plant needs and plant water needs, 
knowing that plant water needs change as they mature. So just thinking about the growth habits of these plants that you are hoping to put in your yard and landscape with, knowing that you know, when you first start out, these plants are going to need a lot more water, but as they grow and as they progress, the water needs are going to change and hopefully the water needs will dwindle year to year. Here we are talking about collecting rainwater, AKA harvesting rainwater. Like we mentioned before, it wasn't until 2016 that harvesting rainwater was actually legal. So now you can collect rainwater and in these slides, we kind of talk about how you can do that. So on average, on an average home size, average rainfall is about 1,000 to 1,500 gallons per year. So if we are collecting rainwater, if we are utilizing our resources that come, it'll save you about 30 to $45 a year, which will add up. Um, 110 gallons will cover a vegetable garden, about seven feet by seven feet, or a turf area that's about 14 feet by 14 feet. 700 square foot of roof will get you 110 gallons of water, which is how much you can collect based on this new bill that was signed in 2016 by John Hickenlooper. You can buy barrels online, you can make your own, you can use various components to make it as elaborate as you want, but they are for outdoor purposes only, on your property only. As mentioned before, you can store up to 110 gallons in two 55 gallon barrels, collect through the downspout, be sure you have a sealable lid to prevent mosquitoes. And single family residents of multifamily, of a multifamily residence of four units or less. So that's the, for that home specifically, that's about how much you can collect. So you have one or two totaling up to 110 gallons for a single family resident of four units or less. This does not allow for use by more than four homes connected by a common wall, AKA townhomes or condos. And HOAs cannot ban rain barrels, but they can impose the appearance and placement requirements, but know that you are able to collect rain through rain barrels. And here is a little figure just kind of talking about what we mentioned before. When is the best time to water your lawn. Again, water your lawn between 6 and 10 a.m. to help reduce evaporation. This talks about how much you should water per week, how often you should water, and thinking about the shape of your irrigation heads, of knowing that any kind of ding or anything that's broken can cost you a lot of money. Moving on into the third principle of xeriscaping, it's limit turf areas. So we'll talk about discovering turf, turf alternatives and how you can save money. Here in Colorado, we use a lot of Kentucky bluegrass and Kentucky bluegrass is actually, it requires a lot of water. Um, to help that, you can use alternative types of grass that use less water, cool season grasses versus warm season grasses, which we do have a slide coming up talking about the difference between those. You can add patios, decks, paths, or shrub, wet, shrub beds, flower beds to help reduce the amount of turf area that you have in your yard as well. Just thinking back to Kevin's picture, Kevin's yard, he removed all of that and was able to fill it in with shrubs, mulch, hardscaping things such as boulders, rocks. You can also use ground cover. Ground cover is a great option to eliminate or reduce turf areas. And it also provides a pleasing aesthetic, especially if the ground cover is a certain type of color. So here is kind of an example of how much water you are actually using per different types of grass. So Kentucky bluegrass is a cool season grass. So here in this graph, the blue highlighted grasses, turfs are cool season grasses, whereas the white highlighted are warm season grasses. 
cool season grasses tend to do a little bit better in the northern in northern climates cool season grasses, they last a little bit longer in um, cooler temperatures. Their optimum temperature of growth is between 60 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but one of the downfalls is that they do require a lot of watering. They tend to brown out a little bit more in the summertime when temperatures get extreme above 90 degrees or so. Uh, when you look at this graph, you see that buffalo grass and blue grama actually only require half an inch to a quarter of an inch of water every two weeks. So when we're thinking about limiting our turf areas or trying to find alternatives, buffalo grass and blue grama grass seem to be a high alternative. And thinking about the fine fescues, though they require the same amount of Kentucky bluegrass, they are probably one of the most shade tolerant of turf grasses and can also tolerate sandy soil. Here are some pictures of blue buffalo grass and blue grama grass, just what they look like up close. Here we have what they look like or what they could look like in your yard if we're thinking about turf alternatives and how to save money and how to reduce water usage. Also, you can mix. So one of a, uh, this is a picture of blue grama and buffalo mix. But one thing that is suggested is to not mix cool season grasses with warm season grasses. So if we are going to do this mixture, as mentioned, blue grama grass and buffalo mix grass are both warm season grasses. So they have the same texture. They are able to tolerate similar temperatures and operate in the same climate. Yeah. So I was going to add a thing here. Um, so uh, the uh, Kentucky bluegrass, um, you know, that is a very durable, um, you know, so if you got pets or kids or something like that, uh, yeah, we're not telling you to eliminate it altogether. Um, I mean, there are areas that it is important to, to use. Um, and so in your backyard where you got the kids and the dogs or something like that, it's a uh, very that's probably your best choice. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if you can, can do alternates, uh, that's what we're looking you to asking you to look into. Um, so a little one advantage and disadvantage of, of each is blue, uh, the Kentucky bluegrass will green up uh, in mid to late March, depending on weather and go all the way into September, October and stay green which is a cool season grass, as Ashley said. The other two, which are warm season grasses, um, they take a little longer. So um, they may not start to green up until mid-May and can go dormant um, in uh, early September. So, you know, that's something you need to think about. If, if it's something you want green more part of the year, then you're gonna to have to look at Kentucky bluegrass. But if you can tolerate a little less growing season, um, and save on that water bill, then your warm season grasses are your better bet, so. Thank you, Kevin. We have, uh, here's a picture of another type of turf alternative. So this is ground cover and it's thick, carpet-like, drought resistant, and it provides a nice aesthetic because of the color. So it's also something to think about, you know, if this is something that you can put in your yard and it's something that you want to try and put in your yard, it's a nice, beautiful alter alternative to add for landscaping. And Kevin will take this away. I, I realize I didn't change the numbers on these slides, so <laughs> we're, we're back to three. <laughs> Uh, no worries. Um, so anyway, um, we're going to talk about selecting appropriate plants. And, and as I mentioned, right plant, right place and that type of thing. So um, this is the fun part, uh, at least for me. It's like, you know, what do you want? The colors and the textures. And, you know, uh, if you're wanting to help the bee population and butterflies and, you know, yeah, this is this is the fun part. So some of the things you want to think about. Um, you know, uh, do you want to use native plants? Uh, native plants are those that um, grow here naturally and, and uh, or in, within the United States even. Um, 
We have uh, plant select, which I'll go into here in a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, color and texture and smells and fragrances and um, water needs, um, combining those um, to, you know, the right plants with the same water zone as Ashley mentioned before. Um, their size and their shape, how big will they get? Um, you know, uh, so many different shapes and si sizes of shrubs and, and, and plants. So, um, you know, dig through those catalogs and online and, and just you know, devour all that info that's there and, and just let your mind go wild. So one of the things that can, can help you out is um, when you're going through the nursery or your big box stores or whatever, um, just because the, with big box stores, um, they get plants from, some of them get them locally, some of them get them um, from their distributor someplace else in the United States. So when, when you're shopping a big box store, uh, I would strongly suggest that you look at the plant tag to make sure that it is um, hardy for zone five. Um, not everything that they sell um, will survive here. Um, so, you know, blueberries, uh, for example, you'll go to Home Depot Lowe's and they'll sell those, but they don't do well here in our, in our clay soil. Um, you can plant those, but you'd have, you have to put them, um, one of the tricks is to plant it in a bale of peat moss and you can get those to grow. But, so be aware of what, what will and what won't grow here. Um, your nurseries obviously will be selling you plants that are, are good for your, um, our environment here in Colorado. So um, anyway, the plant tags, as you see there, gives you a wealth of information, how much sunlight, how much uh, water it needs, type of soil, um, the habit, the growth habit, how high, how wide, um, that type of thing. So use those to help yourself out. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there's uh, multiple, you know, uh, gone are the days of cactus and rock. Um, all these that are pictured here are very low water plants. Um, they're called, by terminology, is xeric type plant. And uh, as you can see, different textures and colors, um, you know, trees as well. Um, the chocolate flower, I, I always have to talk about because that's one of my favorites. Um, it's called chocolate flower because it smells like milk chocolate, and, uh, and I'm not and I'm not lying. It they open up in the morning with the morning sun and close up in mid afternoon in the heat of the day to conserve water. But when you walk by them, um, it's like a candy bar. It, it, it's just totally amazing. So um, I always have to I always have to brag on that one. That's one of my faves. Um, so anyway. Um, the other thing you want to do is don't forget about cacti. Um, you know, a lot of people think they're just kind of ugly, but uh, they do provide a lot of bloom, um, lots of different textures. You know, most people think of when they see cactuses just without their blooms. And so uh, don't forget those. And those are great for if you have a microclimate. And a microclimate is, uh, so for example, we're in zone five. But if you're planting on the south side of your house or south side of a building or something um, that reflects heat and retains heat next to a, a driveway or a sidewalk that helps hold heat in, that kind of increases your, um, your zone there for a little bit. So um, something like cacti will work in some of those hotter zones. Um, so this is kind of a list of some of the trees that are very popular and very successful in our, in our area. Um, check those out, uh, go on to any of the CSU websites and uh, read more information about those, um, your local uh, uh, garden centers as well. These are just a few pictures of some of the ones that uh, grow well here. Um, the one thing, um, What's listed on uh, the uh, size and height and width and stuff may be not as, well, how do I say it? Ours won't probably grow to that extreme. Um, with our soils and, and dry temperatures, um, most of our trees and shrubs don't get to the full mature height as they are listed if you were in another part of, you know, wetter part of the country. So um, keep that in mind, but, uh, um, it just kind of gives you an idea of some of the different shapes and textures is what these photos are for. So um, Plant Select is what I uh, mentioned to you earlier. Plant Select is an organization, a nonprofit that works 
Um, well, I guess it is for profit, but it, the, it was designed by um, the Denver Botanic Gardens and CSU um, looking for plants that they can collect from around the world. And a lot of the select plants, um, we have a major success with getting a lot of them from Africa that have the same type of uh, uh, weather and um, soils and that type of thing. So they go around the world and they search out plants that will work well here. And uh, we included uh, Plant Select 2020 uh, on our presentation because last year uh, we were ready to do our live presentation and the Friday afternoon before Saturday morning's class, we canceled, obviously, as you know, that's when COVID had started. So um, we decided to uh, leave those in there so that uh, for those of you that have watched this presentation over the years, you can still see some of the uh, 2020 uh, plant select. Um, this goes back, I want to say back to 1997 is when they started this. Um, you can go to plantselect.org. Um, and they have a ton of information there. They have all their plants that are listed uh, on there for throughout the years. Um, they have pre-designed gardens, so you can click on that. And if you see a design you like, you can plant yours to match. Um, I highly recommend um, you uh, use this site. Um, it, it's absolutely amazing. And, and the plant list that they have, um, you name it, they got it, and uh, you can't go wrong. They These are tried and true. Um, so what they do when they select a plant, um, there's a long process to this. If they select a plant, um, they work with local growers and they test them out in the field to make sure that they can handle the, the weather types, the, the cold winters and that type of thing. So they kind of do all the hard work for you. They've already tested all these and if they're successful, then they become a plant select plant. And they've got tons of plants in the works coming up. I just attended a, a seminar uh, with these guys and they've got um, a lot more that they're working on and they're in the middle of the study stage, um, seeing how they're going to work. So you'll, you may see some that are at the Botanic Gardens that uh, haven't become an official plant yet, but you'll see them as uh, in their test gardens and so forth. So anyway, uh, this is a, a very key um, uh, asset for you guys to take a look at. And just so you guys know, uh, this, this is being recorded so that you can go back and look at all these slides and, and so forth later. Um, they'll be um, for, your, for you to review if you uh, miss some of these, so. And I think this goes back to Ashley. Okay, so now we are talking about mulch and the benefits of why we should mulch. So here's a little illustration as to why mulching is beneficial. It helps reduce weed, weed growth. Um, it helps prevent fluctuating soil temperatures, improve soil texture, reduces erosion, reduces compaction, adds beauty to landscape, especially with the different types of mulch that you can use and can purchase. Texture contrast, again, same thing with adds beauty to the landscape and it prevents water evaporation. There are two different types of mulches that we will cover, organic versus inorganic. Here's a slide talking about organic mulch, which is or was once living a natural occurring substance. Pine needles, wood chips, pine bark nuggets, chipped branches, chipped Christmas trees. Here at the city and county of Broomfield, we actually do something really cool, which I didn't know about until I started, but if you are a resident here, you do have access to free mulch at the tree branch recycle. Um, just as long as you have something with an address here with the Broomfield address, you have access to that free mulch. You can also utilize your tree branch recycle, dumping off shrubs and branches knowing that there are certain types of rules that come with it, but it is actually a really cool thing that you guys can take advantage of and you can use it to mulch your yard. Here we talk about inorganic mulch, which was a non-living sub non substance. Think rock, cobble, pea gravel, crusher finds, rubber. 
this is also something that we tend to talk about as hardscaping. So you can use it in your landscaping, but we will note it as hardscaping. Landscape fabric. There's a lot of pros and cons that come with the idea of using landscape fabric. Pros, it helps reduce weed growth. Know that probably in the first one to two years, it will help. You'll see a significant difference, but there are going to be some struggles. There are going to be things that you're going to have to worry about knowing that weeds are still going to grow, hence the big bold in the con section. But it is useful in hardscaping installations. As mentioned before, you know, if you are going to put in rock or cobble in any of your landscaping designs, landscape fabric is good to use as a base underneath that hardscaping. It'll help with erosion control, retain soil mo moisture to a certain extent. Like we mentioned, the first one to two years, it will be helpful, but know that after that, it might give you a little bit more work than you bargained for. Under the cons, it'll compact the soil because we're gonna have that fabric sitting on top. There's not gonna be a lot of air for the soil to, for there's not gonna be a lot of air to penetrate the soil. So the soil is gonna compact and it's gonna get condensed and having no air in the soil means less nutrients. So you're gonna have some malnourished soil in turn leading to some low nutrient plants and your plants may not do well or may not thrive. And to the bottom of this cons list, weeds you're still going to get a lot of weeds. You're still going to have to weed. You're still going to have to spray. Sometimes it may be more of a hassle because the weeds tend to root in the landscape fabric. So when you are weeding, you might actually end up pull the fab, pulling the fabric. That's happened to me multiple times here in the field. And I end up just removing the fabric because it's better for the soil. It's better for the plants in general. But again, utilize this to your discretion. If you're gonna use landscape fabric, I would suggest doing research on it because there are different types of fabric that you can use. And here we talk about where you should use it if you are gonna use landscape fabric, hardscaping, rock mulch, and where you should not use it would be gardens, anything that requires constant digging, shrub beds, and perennial beds. Alternatives to landscape fabric, if you do like the idea of landscape fabric, but you don't want the work that comes with it, there's mulch, like we talked about, you know, we're in the mulch section, mulch actually provides a lot of good things for your landscaping. Newspaper, pre-emergent application of herbicides, and other alternatives that you can look into if you are wanting to go the route of landscape fabric or negate it completely. Some takeaways, it will help with weed control as mentioned, but it will not stop weed growth. So you're still gonna get weeds, 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 weeds. Pick fabric that best suits your needs. There's thick versus thin, utilization of staples. It depends on what you're using this fabric for. You know, if you're gonna use this fabric for hardscaping, thicker fabric, of course, and you want staples that go deep into the ground. Think about the alternatives. Like we said, mulch, newspaper, pre-emergent applications, of course, weeding. Keep in mind that you will still need to weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one product is a miracle product in weed prevention. So you have to incorporate mulch, pre-emergent applications, manual weeding. When you combine all of those two together, it's actually a better thing for your garden or for your landscaping because you're providing different alternatives to preventing weeds. All right, so I'm gonna go over the uh, maintenance part of things. Um, uh, kind of a, just a broad generalization of uh, things that uh, to think about throughout the year of, of different things. I mean, for those of you who are gardeners already, um, you know, it's kind of a year round um, 
undertaking. It's not just necessarily uh, during the summertime, um, but anyway, we'll go through a few of those items. Um, so, you know, we talk about zero scaping and, and a lot of people call it zero scaping, which is, you know, always kind of makes me cringe because that's not what it is. Um, but anyway, uh, there's always people thinking that, well, if I go this route, there's no maintenance and, and there is no such thing as no maintenance. Um, there's always some level of maintenance and using xeriscaping practices and stuff uh, will lessen some of those um, maintenance practices and so, but not eliminate them all altogether. Um, well, I just kind of mentioned that. So, um, you know, it can reduce maintenance and expenses up to 50%. Um, you still need to water as needed. Um, proper pruning and deadheading of your plants and, and flowers and so forth, um, and, and obviously include mulching, which we just discuss, discussed. So, we're, you know, this is kind of an overview of some seasonal tasks. So in the wintertime, this time of the year, or just this past few months, um, you know, you're cleaning your tools, um, getting them ready for the springtime, uh, looking to see uh, what new things you need to maybe repair or need to purchase. Um, you know, start planning and thinking about your upcoming season. Uh, what is it you want to accomplish this year uh, for those that are looking at more annual type beds and that type of thing um, that uh, you change from year to year. And so now's the time to start thinking about those. Good time to be pruning trees and shrubs for structure because um, they don't have their leaves on them and you can see the structure of the, of the plant better. And uh, that helps you uh, uh, do a better job of pruning. And obviously, you know, the fun part of it all where we all uh, geek out over looking at the seed catalogs and wanting to, uh, to, to dream about, oh, once the snow's done, I'm ready to go, so. So we're just kind of starting this time of the year. Um, you know, uh, we've got bulbs that are starting to peek through. I've seen a couple already, as a matter of fact, uh, that are in those little microclimates uh, that are just starting to pop through. Um, ornamental grasses, if you haven't cut them down uh, during the winter months, this is a good time. Um, this is probably towards the end of the time. Uh, you want to get those cut down. That way it allows uh, the rain and the water and air to get uh, back to the centers of those grasses. And then they'll, uh, they'll come back again. Um, start your seeds indoors. Uh, get a head start on those. Um, if you in the fall, and we'll cover this in a minute, but um, in the fall, we tend to uh, want to wrap our trees that are about four inches in diameter um, that have a smooth bark. Um, and what that does is it prevents sun scald. And um, that is uh, here in Colorado, as you guys that have been here a while know, we can go from 70 degree day and then drop down into the teens overnight and then back up again. Well, that puts major stress on the uh, plant material. And uh, so for example, we're here in the middle of winter, um, 20 degree days and we get that spike of a day of 70 degrees and then goes back down. That'll tend to uh, affect the phloem or the sap in the tree and it will start to crack the bark and so forth. So what this does is uh, protects that, it helps pr protect from the, um, fluctuations in the temperatures. So um, if you did that in the fall and put that on, now's the time to remove that here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's usually mid-April is what we kind of shoot for here. And uh, um, you'll be starting getting a lot of advertisements now for people who want to aerate your yard. Uh, now's a good time to do that. Uh, weeding, weeds are starting to pop. Uh, they tend to show up and, and green up before our uh, nice, lovely plants that we want to have around happen, but um, get ready for that. Fertilize, uh, plant, uh, when you get into, uh, you want to be careful when you're planting annuals here in Colorado. Um, for your newcomers, um, we have late frost. Um, the rule of thumb is not to plant annuals um, until, and tender perennials until after Mother's Day is the kind of the guideline. So mid-May, because we've, we've had snows at the end of May, early June, um, so you want to be careful of that so you don't uh, um, lose your plants. So um, other than that, uh, you know, mowing will be starting up and time to start planting. Uh, summertime is more, is more of your maintenance time of year. Um, practicing IPM, which is integrated pest management, uh, and pests include weeds and insects and 
uh, other animals and so forth, uh, keeping an eye on those, uh, looking for um, bugs and slugs and stuff that are um, affecting your plants and, and um, treat them accordingly. Um, always keep an eye on your irrigation, as I had mentioned before. Um, always want to make sure that uh, they're in adjustment. Um, I would say if you're in a house that has uh, had an irrigation system for at least 10 years or longer, you might want to, um, I think Ashley will bring this up later, but do an irrigation audit. Um, it, uh, it's, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's free. All you gotta do is sign up and they'll come out and take a look at your irrigation system. Um, that technology has changed tremendously over the years um, to be a lot more efficient and, and so forth. So if you've got old irrigation components, uh, now's, you know, now's a good time um, to uh, make sure that uh, you're up to par. Um, doing your normal routine maintenance of pruning and deadheading. And of course, you know, the weeds are always rampant. And then um, and towards the end of the August, September, um, if you've got thin spots in your uh, cool season grasses, then that's a good time to start uh, doing some overseeding uh, for fall. So then we uh, kind of wrap up uh, fall. Um, now's, that'd be the time where you wanna plant your bulbs for next spring. Uh, trees, that's a perfect time of year uh, to plant trees is in the fall. Um, do a fall aeration. Um, that one's uh, somewhat debatable. Um, as Ashley mentioned before, our, the temperatures here in the past couple of years have been a little higher and we've become a little bit drier. Um, so I would hesitate um, to aerate in the fall now um, because when you're pulling the plugs, that's the type of aeration you want to do is where they're pulling a plug out of the, out of the turf. Um, if we do that in the fall and we don't get any winter snows and we have high winds and stuff that will actually dry out those uh, grass roots and could be more of a hindrance. So that one is kind of one to play by ear. If you've got an area that's protected um, from the wind and that type of thing, maybe it's good to go. Fall fertilization, you want to get the roots to all your shrubs and trees and uh, turf um, ready to handle the winter. Um, you know, obviously we're cleaning up gardens and deadheading and that type of thing. Uh, annual beds, gardens, we want to start turning those, um, get those ready for, for winter. Uh, very important, you want to uh, either yourself or hire somebody to uh, winterize your sprinkler systems because uh, if you don't, uh, they could freeze and then um, you'll have major water issues in the spring. Um, it's relatively simple to, to do. Um, if you go on to the city website under the parks and irrigation, uh, we actually have a video that shows you how to do it. And it's very, very simple uh, to do it yourself. And as I mentioned before, you want to wrap trees that uh, are young and have smooth bark uh, to protect from the winter scal uh, scalding. And then um, one thing not to forget throughout the winter time, especially here, if we go through a very hot, warm, dry spell, or even, even if the temperatures aren't up during the winter time, but it's a dry spell, you still need to do some winter watering. Uh, hook up your hose, uh, garden hose to your outdoor faucet, and especially any new plants that you've planted. So if you planted some trees in the fall, um, you know, they're new, one or two years old, um, it's wise to winter water those anytime you can, as long as the ground isn't frozen, go out there and add some water to those plants as well. And, I and to just kind of wrap everything up with the seven principles of Xeriscape, Zier here's just a recap, you know, plan ahead. Make sure you're thinking about what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be landscaping and utilizing your land in a proper way for your needs, improving the soil, you know, amending it, adding in that organic matter, taking it in for a soil sample to see what kind of soil you have and what kind of organic matter would be best for your yard. Irrigate efficiently. We've talked a lot about water usage and how best you can minimize your waste limiting turf areas or finding alternatives, paying attention to whether or not you would like that Kentucky bluegrass in your yard if you have pets, if you need something a little bit more sturdy, or if we're thinking about switching over to the warm season grasses and finding that blend, finding that perfect mix that'll be good for your yard or those ground cover alternatives like that time. Um, select appropriate plants, 
using that plant select website, you know, like Kevin said, they they did all the work for you. And so all you really need to do is just pick which plants would be best for you. Mulching, whether or not you're going to use landscape fabric, how it's going to best fit in your yard and suit your needs and paying attention to maintenance. What, what kind of maintenance needs to be done in the fall, spring, summer, winter, and keeping up with those tasks, knowing that a zero maintenance garden or yard is a myth. You're still gonna have to do some work. We will move into native plants, um, why we should go native. They're adaptable. They're native here, so they're well versed in Colorado's high and low and dry climate already. They're sustainable in that because they are adaptable, they don't require as much needs as some other plants would. They attract wildlife, maintain biodiversity, and circling back reduction in maintenance. So we're thinking about this presentation, we're trying to reduce the maintenance that we want for our yard. Going native is actually a really great way to do that. And they're unique, you know, that's, they're unique to Colorado. They're unique to this landscape. They're unique to what we see here in Colorado and from people that are moving here, aren't quite used to seeing what it's like here in Colorado. These plants kind of provide that for you. Like this is what Colorado looks like. Here's a slide about what you need to know when you are wanting to plant native plants, where to grow slash plant your shrubs, trees, and perennial plants. There are five different life zones here in Colorado, which I will talk about in the next slide. And know that going native doesn't exclude the use of adapted non-native plants. Non-native plants that are adapted to Colorado's climate can be used in native landscaping as long as the plant needs are similar. We talk a lot about planting plants based on water needs or based on similar needs. So native plants and non-native plants are the same, so long as they are requiring the same kind of maintenance in general. And pocket gardens. So a pocket garden is a garden of plants in areas that would otherwise remain bare. Um, it's the utilization of native plants because they require less maintenance or irrigation. So if you're thinking about a site and it has a non-native landscape that requires additional irrigation or additional input, dry land native plants can actually be used, used in those non-irrigated pockets within the non-native landscape, which is why they are called pocket gardens. They can be located in areas such as parkways and next to hardscapes that are difficult to irrigate. Here is a slide talking about the five different life zones in Colorado. We have the Plains, Foothills, Upper Sonoran, Upper Sonoran, Montane, and Alpine. And underneath, it's just the kind of the elevation where these five life zones fall into. So Broomfield has an elevation of 5,420 feet. So we can kind of be classified as plains or foothills, because we are very close to the mountains. The front range is right there. The flat irons are right there, which is in our city and county symbol. Here is a slide kind of going into what trees grow best in what life zone and shrubs. So it's just kind of going into detail where these trees do best. So for like in the plains, of course, we're gonna see a lot of cottonwoods as we go higher up into the alpines, no trees, there's a lot of dominating tundra. If you've ever had the experience of hiking up in Rocky Mountain National Park, there is actually a lot of hikes where you can see the different transitions between these five different life zones, which is really amazing. If you are able to get up into the alpine life zone, there's a hike that I believe I don't remember which hike it is, but you transition from tree line to not seeing any trees, but you are seeing a lot of tundra. And it's nice to see the different kinds of life that lives there and the different kinds of plants that thrive in these certain life, life zones. Um, there are about 50 native trees here in Colorado. So 
when we talk about trees and when we talk about going native, there's a lot of options you can choose from. And just a few examples of trees, ponderosa, gamble oak, shrubs would be wild rose, twinberry fruit, or perennial plants that are native here to Colorado, the Rocky Mountain penstemon, and arbels. So I'm gonna to touch base. Um, we kind of added this uh, uh, information a little later in the, uh, after a few years, we had people asking about uh, damage by critters. And so um, we'll touch base on this a little bit. Um, vole damage, uh, vole, if you're not aware, is uh, basically a little bit bigger than a mouse, um, a little bit longer. Um, they like to uh, chew on the roots in the bottom parts of a plant. Uh, shrubs uh, mostly, but you'll see them on, on some perennials as well. And uh, what's tough about that is you don't necessarily see the damage sometimes because uh, they're chewing the roots just under the surface, uh, soil surface. And all of a sudden you realize, well, that plant's not looking very well or it didn't green up this spring. And then you go touch it and it falls over. There's nothing there. All the roots have been chewed off. Um, so some of the things that can help uh, eliminate that is to keep your um, shrubs lifted up off the ground a little bit because they uh, they like to hide and burrow in in, in under plants. Um, you'll see that in a, in a photo coming up here in a little bit. Um, using mouse traps and that type of thing is uh, a, a good way to do that. Um, sometimes there are some repellents out there, not overly effective, probably not the best to, to do. Um, there are some toxicants out there, but they're pretty potent. Um, I wouldn't recommend that uh, um, uh, because especially uh, the city doesn't use these types of things because we can't control target species. Um, we don't want to. We don't want kids or pets or uh, that uh, getting into any of these types of things. So, uh, matter of fact, we really just don't do anything for damage other than the maintenance part of it of um, keeping things pruned up and deadheaded and that type of thing. So. So there's a picture of the cute little critter right there. Um, if you see the little trails on the upper right hand corner in your turf, uh, those little trails in there, well, that's that's vole damage. Uh, uh, they like to burrow through the turf. Um, so if you see that, you know you've got a nest somewhere. Um, as I was talking, the lower right, um, you know, that's they ate the the roots away, and all of a sudden uh, there's nothing left. And uh, so anyway, those are some of the signs to look for if you see. Um, some plants with damage, uh, you may have some voles. Um, rabbit damage, uh, you know, they, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, they tend to eat turf, they'll eat shrubs, they'll eat the barks in the wintertime when they're really looking for food to eat. They'll um, eat the uh, bottoms of tree trunks, um, especially if it's a new, um, relatively young tree um, where it doesn't have a lot of bark yet. Um, so that's another advantage of doing uh, tree wrap too on a young tree, um, prevents them from jumping down on that. Um, some of the good repellents, uh, though short term, because if it's regularly irrigated and or um, rain, snow, um, it washes away these, but using blood meal, um, those types of things um, are very effective, well, can be effective. Um, fright devices, uh, motion detectors, uh, fake owls and snakes and that type of thing, um, we don't, as mentioned before, we don't tend to recommend any types of toxicants for that as well. Um, so it's kind of the same the, the on that red twig dogwood, you know, they'll eat at the bottom. Um, you'll be surprised uh, how high up into a shrub uh, tree, they, tree trunk they can get. Uh, they'll stand on their hind corners and, and, and chew away, um, especially if we don't have, you know, if it's dry and there's no vegetation. The bottom right hand, or the bottom photo there is actually turf. Well, was turf. Um, uh, they'll totally decimate an area if they get stuck in one spot. And um, and what's hard about that is uh, trying to rejuvenate that. Um, you know, if you if you overseed it and put in new seed, well, they're going to eat the new seedlings. And if you do sod, 
and tear it out. Eventually, um, it's, it's an area that they've been accustomed to and they may come back and, and chew it all up again. So it's a difficult situation dealing with rabbits as, as some of you probably already know. And Ashley's gonna do summary. And just to summarize everything that we've talked about, we'll just kind of touch on the seven principles of escaping. So what is it? You know, we already kind of talked about, it's not zero escaping, but it is zero escaping and where we're trying to limit our maintenance and we're trying to conserve the amount of water that we're using for our yard, for our landscaping. And talking about how it's changed and how does it fit with sustainability? Again, with water usage, how can we limit our water, but also get a really nice yard? Irrigation, new irrigation types, maintenance techniques, paying attention to our sprinkler heads, making sure they're in tip top shape so we can save ourselves money. Maintenance and mulch, of course, you're still gonna do a lot of maintenance on your yard. Hopefully with zero escaping, you're going to do less maintenance, about half the amount of maintenance that you would if you weren't subjecting your time to wanting to change the landscape of your yard, mulch, different types of mulch, utilization of landscape fabric, if that's for you, planning ahead with zones and soil, testing your soil, taking it in for a soil sample, planting your plants together with similar zone factors, and similar plant needs, turf alternatives. Gone are the days of perfectly groomed bluegrasses, lawns, or landscape yards of rocks and yucca. So that's kind of what we would think about. That's kind of our stereotype, right? With stereoscaping, it's just a lot of rock and only rock and maybe a cactus here or two. But hopefully after this presentation, you can kind of translate that out of your mind and think about, oh, you know, I can put pretty plants in my yard and I can make my yard look a lot nicer than just having it be rock. And talking about that, select appropriate plants, you know, taking advantage of this plant select website and knowing that they have done the work already for you, you just get to pick and choose. And here's some questions to kind of ask yourself prior to wanting to do this for your yard. It's how will you use the area? planning ahead, right? Outside living, are you gonna use it for storage? Are you gonna put a garden or are you gonna use it for something else? Do you have pets? What about your kids? What is your relationship with your yard? Do you have the time for maintenance? How much money is in your budget to be able to create the yard that you want for yourself? What styles do you like? Do you like the formal versus informal kind of garden, curvier straight lines, or maybe you want a little bit of everything? And where are you gonna put your plants? Thinking about the location of your yard and the location of your planting, whether some side is sunny or shady, flat or steep, things to think about when you are on this journey for yourself. So with all of that, here is the information that is listed in these next two slides, where we got our information from, and like Kevin said, this is recorded. Uh, so you can come back to these slides. You can look at this information. You can do the research yourself if you would like to do that. And we just want to thank you for allowing us to talk to you through this platform. I know it's a little different for all of us. And for us not to be able to see your faces, it makes it a little bit harder because we're looking at a screen and we like to be able to connect. We like to be able to see your faces and answer questions and interact. So this is, um, this is new, but it's a good change and it's a good transition for us to kind of do something new for ourselves. So we thank you for your patience. We thank you for your time. And here we have our emails just in case you need to contact us for anything. And there's also the Q&A button. If you have questions, we will get to them soon. Yeah, so um, looks like we do have a, a few questions. Um, uh, Mary had mentioned, uh, will the slides be available for download? As we just mentioned, um, this is recorded and you can go back in and view it at your leisure and, and stop on whatever slide you need to look at. 
Um, we have another question about uh, what do you use to remove turf grass? A um, couple options there. Um, you can use a sod cutter um, to uh, strip that off the top um, and then just discard that. And then you'll wanna come back um, and then uh, definitely add compost uh, to, uh, you know, you're taking some of the soil with you when you're, when you're cutting off the turf grass. Um, and so you wanna uh, add compost and we recommend uh, at least five cubic yards per thousand square feet um, of compost uh, to use. Uh, um, that's a kind of a good guideline for, uh, for you to use. Um, another option, and uh, um, this can be uh, riling to some people, but Roundup is a good alternative to removing turf grass, killing that off, and then you can just till that right on into the soil. Um, there's no residual uh, in the soil uh, with that, um, but uh, I understand some people um, are, are not uh, interested in using Roundup, and that's perfectly fine. Um, there are, you know, like I said, you can use a sod cutter or whatever, uh, lay down newspapers, uh, go ahead and use black plastic and, and put it down and let it sit, and the sun will cook it and kill it, and then you can till it in. And so you have, you have other options other than chemical um, um, applications. Um, if you use plant select website to choose plants, will those plants still support native wildlife? Yes. Um, the, a lot of these plants, uh, you know, are great for, uh, most of them, if not almost all of them are great for bees and butterflies, um, for sure. Hummingbirds, um, they're, um, you know, the agastaches, uh, there's a wide variety of those on the website. Um, uh, those are huge for um, all those, uh, the bees and especially hummingbirds as well. So, um, so anyway, there those, yes, that will help support many uh, native wildlife for sure. Um, that's all I see in the question answer, but I see we have a chat too. Let me jump into that. Ah, there was a question about a little bit of an echo earlier. I think we fixed that. So um, we are good to go there. Um, so any other questions uh, that you would like to bring up at this point in time? Um, we'll hang out here for, uh, I don't know, about another five, 10 minutes, perhaps. So uh, we were thinking we'd go to 1130 and it's about 1122 right now. Um, so we can hang out if you want to add a few more questions. Um, other than that, uh, we always, as, uh, as uh, Ashley mentioned, we have um, our uh, email addresses that you can email us at any time uh, with questions, especially those who will be watching this at a later time when it's not live. I'm gonna let you take that next. Sorry, no worries. Um, so Mary asked, uh, can you intersperse the pink chintz thyme in lawn to have it grow? Um, I would say you might be able to do it if you're using a warm season grass, um, uh, using the, um, if you try to do bluegrass, the bluegrass will probably choke it out um, because it's very dense and, and very uh, competitive. Um, the blue grandma is a bunch grass um, so it may work inter interspersed with, with your time. That might be one to try. I, I, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know why it's not So anyway, uh, as, as Ashley mentioned, we do appreciate your time. Uh, we hope that this came across fairly well. This is new to us. Um, first time we've ever done this uh, through this type of medium. Um, anyway, we, uh, we, we enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully we, you found lots of good information that you can use. Um, opens up some uh, thought processes and, and gets you thinking about spring, which is just right around the corner once we get past this uh, snow event that they're uh, calling for. And uh, um, with that, I think we'll call it good. Um, unless somebody has one last question. Uh, let me look here. Oh, yep, there's a couple that popped across. I just didn't scroll down, my bad. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for the information. I, you, uh, they appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, 
And then Mary's going to check and see what type of grass she has. Perfect. Good idea. Um, yeah. Um, take a look at those. Uh, um, yeah. Bluegrass, uh, I, I'm afraid I don't think it'll work. It'll choke it out. Uh, do ground covers tolerate any foot traffic? Uh, yes, some do, some don't. Uh, so research on that. Um, if you go to your garden centers and to your nurseries and stuff, there is a brand out there that's called Steppables. And they're designed to put between flagstone pathways and so forth to where, yes, they will uh, tolerate some foot traffic. Um, you know, if it's constant foot traffic, I don't know if there's anything um, that will tolerate that, but uh, periodic uh, foot traffic, absolutely. Um, Steppables is one of the names of the uh, of, uh, items that you can look with a wide variety of uh, uh, plant choices. So yes. And then Mary says, thank you both. Uh, great job, newbie Zoom presenters. Cool, <laughs> glad it worked. We appreciate you guys as well. So um, I think, uh, I think we'll call this good. Um, uh, thank you all again. And uh, feel free to email either one of us if you uh, think of other questions. Thank you.